So today, in a way, is actually the most fun part of the class because we're going to do very large scale latent variable models. So this is stuff that essentially we've been working on at Yale for the past three to four years. And at the moment, I don't think a lot of other places know. I hope that after you know all of this, those of you who go to industry will, you know, spread the word, spread the techniques. So I think there's a lot of very fun things that you can do if you know how to scale up those latent variable models. So um, what I'm going to start with is actually latent Dirichlet allocation. Some of you may or may not have seen this already. And there are more slides in this course than there is time to get through. The rest is essentially supplementary material that you can look through at your own leisure. Um, so let's just briefly explain how LDA works. <laughs> so you've probably seen those pictures before. Let's say you know I have some web pages, and I could all cluster them and say, well, that's probably single port, right? Then I get a few more pages, right? That's Japanese. You may or may not have recognized it. It's the Australian National University. United Airlines, and you could group them by, you know, airline, university, and restaurants, or you could group them by countries. And so if you think about what you would be doing in clustering, well, you would sort of expect your clustering algorithm to do the right thing, except that you have no idea what the right thing is, right? If somebody thinks that the right thing is you should partition by countries, the other one thinks you know you should partition it by what those web pages actually provide. And in such cases where you can really keep on arguing for hours about what the right way of partitioning things is, it usually means that your representation isn't amazingly good. So wouldn't it be much nicer if you actually had something like this, right? So you now have you know several tags for each of those objects. And so you can argue, well, that's maybe a more truthful representation of what the data looks like. So just to explain a little bit what's going on, um, I guess none of you is old enough to have worked on an 8 or 16-bit uh, well, uh, CRT display on a computer. Who ever worked on a, such an old display? OK. You may have seen at some point that thing when you were using the mouse, that if you moved from one window to the other, the, the entire screen would go funny in terms of color. What really happened is that, you know, the graphics cards weren't really able to deal with, you know, 24-bit colors, and so they would actually go and cluster all the colors. If you had a green scene, then you would have, you know, mainly green color templates, and then if you moved the cursor outside of this green image, everything else would go fuzzy. Um, but you know, you can go and you know group like those colors by prototypes. And if you then get something like gray, you really don't know where it belongs. And with topic models, well, this is you know a little bit more adequate way. You basically say you know any of those colors are you know linear mixtures of some prime colors. So you can immediately see that with you know three colors, you get much further than with you know maybe 10, 20 clusters that you could have in here. Just because you can actually reach the entire space in between. So the key difference between topic models and clustering is that in topic models you try to decompose objects into combinations of prototypes, whereas clustering you say, well, it's either one or another prototype. So for instance, if you have a traffic light, you know, you have exactly three states. It makes perfect sense to, you know, you know, cluster into those three different states. It doesn't make much sense to say I'm somewhere in between red and green. Well, that only gives you traffic tickets. Yeah, um, yeah been there, not there. Um, whereas, so basically in that case, the inductive bias of not being quite certain of about your state just means, well, you don't quite know whether it's red or green but it's not some state in between. So basically, this is not a valid object here, but it's a perfectly valid object there. So in terms of statistics, well, what it really means is that in clustering, if we had something like a bag of words model, well, we first go and draw you know, the cluster probability from our prior, and we'll get into that in a lot more detail in a moment. 
and then you know for a particular document I decide okay maybe let's plus the twenty and then I draw all the words from that you know from the corresponding word model for that for plus the number twenty. Now for the topic model it's essentially the same structure as what we saw here. The only difference is that all the plates have moved one off. So what it means is that now each document in its own right obtains a distribution over clusters, so to say. In that case, we call them topics rather than clusters. And then for each word, I have a separate variable which decides which topic I draw the word from. And while this is super popular in the context of you know, multinomials, there's nothing to prevent you from you know, having a Gaussian emissions model there. People haven't done that to a large extent, and I'm actually surprised about why this hasn't happened. But there's no reason why you shouldn't actually be using a Gaussian emissions model here. So I would imagine that a tier two or a tier three conference, you can still get a paper published where you have a collapsed sampler with a Gaussian emissions model. Isn't that the supervised SLDA? Not quite. So this is just the emissions model, as in you know how I assume that the data that I'm observing is obtained. So for instance, if I have texts, it makes sense to have you know, some bag of words or then fancier structures. But for instance, if these were you know, height and weight pairs, or maybe I have something like um, maybe you know, image patches and I have some attributes for that, I might need a different emissions model. Supervised LDA would be something where I say, well, look, I have a model for my data. And then I also have a model for the labels given the data. And there's a slightly different conditioning that's happening. Let me show you that in the whiteboard. Uh -huh. By the way, thanks for asking the question. Um, so what we do in a lot of unsupervised modeling is we model P of X parameterized by some parameter theta. Can you sort of read that in the back? Sort of, I suppose. Now, what you would often do in a supervised setup, you would try to model P of Y given X and theta. And that might actually very well be a different theta. So let's just call it, you know, let's call it W. So usually in the SVM, you try to model Y given X. Now, what you would, so the first use of LDA, so actually that was in the Blyne and Jordan paper, they basically ran this. They obtained some topic IDs per document. And then they plugged this quantity here. So here. So let me just call it theta of x. They actually eliminated eliminated x itself and just estimated p of y given w and theta x. And then supervised the LDA essentially say, well, you know, let's just optimize all of that joint. That's more or less the idea. And then depending on whether you have a probabilistic model or whether you take logs of all of that and then have, you know, whatever SVM loss function, people have written different papers on that. And you get more or less ugly looking optimization problems and depending on how you solve them, again, you can write different papers about it. But that's essentially all the idea that there is in supervised LDA. Some formulations are computationally way more attractive to solve. So for instance, there's the FLDA uh, paper by Agarwal and Chen, and that's probably one of the nicest ones. I think it's around 2010, 2010 or maybe 2009. So the nice thing about their setup is that they have what's called a collapsed sampler. They have a very nice likelihood model here, and we'll get into that 
in moment when we actually look at collapsed samplers. So don't worry if that doesn't make much sense to you yet what a collapsed sampler is. We'll get to that in a few slides. Okay. Does that sort of address your question? Okay. Now here's yet another way how you can look at these models. Um, so you may have seen factorization models for documents. So let's say I have, you know, a document by word matrix, right? And, well, I want to, you know, represent that matrix in some way. So you could, for instance, you know, do a singular value decomposition on it. And maybe about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, if you did singular value decompositions, you would give it a different name and call it latent semantic indexing, and many tenure cases have been won with that. And it's basically PCA. Now, science has moved on from that. By now, well, you know, rather than just having arbitrary factors, which you know would you know map each document to you know subspace and then all the words to the corresponding subspaces, you could say, well, you know, this membership matrix, so it's basically you know, documents by you know number of topics or whatever you have or number of clusters, can only have one non-zero entry per column. It has basically all zeros in one one. Uh, in that case, you get clustering. It basically says, well, we want to represent this matrix here by pulling out strips from this matrix and copying it over. That essentially is clustering. And then you have some approximation error here. An atomic model simply says, well, look, we want to have a possibly sparse combination of some columns here from that dictionary to represent that matrix. And if you do sparse coding, you're going to do something very similar. And again, depending on which specific algorithm you choose, you get slightly different guarantees and properties. So for instance, you can use non-negative matrix factorization, in which case you require that all those entries are non-negative. You could have you know, constraints that you have a stochastic matrix, a doubly stochastic matrix. And again, this was all the rage maybe about five to ten years ago, where people proposed different constraints on those two left matrices to approximate this. And then depending on what loss function you pick, again, you get a different problem. I mean, actually, there's still active research in that area, but this is sort of the high-level view of what's really happening. So when you see one of those papers, don't be scared about some yeah, intimidatingly looking math because, yeah. That's really what it is here. So this was a very, very nice example of what you can do with those methods. So that was from that first LDA paper from 2003. Um, so they took you know, New York Times articles and then color coded the most likely topic for particular words. And you know you can probably see that you know green is sort of money related, and then red was you know pertaining to the arts. And then, I'm not quite sure what blue is, but it has a lot of first in it. Okay, if you tell me. Uh, purple was maybe education, at least it has taught at school and Monday. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so that I thought was quite, this was a very, very, very nice decomposition. So you could now, you know, disambiguate words. And this is a non-trivial problem. So for instance, I mean, if you search for Apple right, on the internet, then you, know, you, you could have very different intents. You, know, you could actually want to eat an apple, or you could want to buy a laptop, or who knows that. You could be interested in music and be interested in Apple records. And it's useful to know which of those meanings you might actually be most interested in. And it's also useful to know, you know, when I go and summarize all the results to, you know, really address those various aspects. And things like topic models or other, you know, embeddings are useful in that context. So it has actually fairly widespread uses. Now let's look a little bit at the math. So that's where the problem begins. So here's the model again, and I've just written it in a bit more detail, namely I've also, you know, specified the prior on the emissions model here. That's just what I chopped off before 
for the sake of simplicity. Okay. So what do we get? We have a Dirichlet prior on those status, and at the moment I'm just right, assuming that these are probabilities. And I mean, this is stuff that you can look up in Wikipedia, basically. You know, you look at Dirichlet distribution, and you get this nice-looking term. Now, if you look at it, squint it a little bit harder, and we know that Dirichlet is a conjugate to the multinomial. So remember the exponential families lecture? We looked at conjugates. Don't worry, it'll come back here. We basically see that this looks like, you know, the various probabilities that we might have picked were raised to some number of counts. Those alpha i minus ones are like pseudo counts of fake data that we might have seen. Okay. So drawing the topic label itself is then fairly easy. You know, you just you know have your probability distribution to draw from that. Um, then the work probabilities themselves, again, you do a very simple lookup, right? What you do is you basically look up, you know, for each topic, you know, what the word distribution is, and then, you know, maybe for topic number 20, the word house, you know, it's probably point one, so that's what goes here. And then on the bottom here, we have exactly the same model as on the top, then we can the prime. So what we have is a little bit more complex than just a, you know, exponential family distribution and conjugate, but we have two of them essentially interlocking with each other. And it's taken people quite a while to understand that this is really the key difference. And at least when I read the original papers, it wasn't so clear to me. So there's an interesting difference between like the Chinese restaurant process and the well and like the actual allocation. And those Differences were, at least in the first papers as they were written, they didn't come out quite as clearly as I think it would have been useful for the community. Um, but I think by now it's fairly well understood. Um, now, let's see how we can actually do inference. So one way how you could do inference is you could just go and sample from that. Another way is you could use variational inference. And if you, for instance, played with the VW LDA implementation, you would have seen a variational inference method. And we'll talk through that in a bit more detail uh, probably after the break. Um, but let's first look at what you can do if you integrate out things. And this is essentially an idea that Griffith and Stivers, so Tom Griffith here, uh, came up with. And in hindsight, it's blindingly obvious, just that at the time when they came up with it, it wasn't. So if you have a conjugate distribution, then you can integrate out the natural parameter that goes with the distribution. And then you have a collapsed representation because you manage to get rid of this and that. So now you only have discrete variables. Now why is this a good thing? Because keeping track of just, you know, integers which have a fairly bounded range of values, maybe one to a thousand, is so much easier than keeping track of a lot of flows. You need those guys anyway. And so effectively, what happened is that you can, you know, go and integrate out these thetas and the phi's. So what you think it is something that looks a little bit more messy, and uh, this is highly non-standard notation, but I think this is an effective <coughs> way of representing what's going on. So when you see those dashed lines, I mean that things are not independent of each other anymore but they're exchangeable, condition everything else around them. So what the inner you know, dashed plate means just is that the individual words and topic assignments are exchangeable in the order in which they occur within a document, but they are not independent from each other anymore. Simple example, uh, if you, know, you receive a letter and it says, Lieber Herr Smola, then you know immediately, well, this is not an English document. As a matter of fact, you can pretty much assume it's a document in German. And every following word from that, you can then, you know, is, well, while it might not be, well, at least in a bag of words model, it will, you know, we are just throwing away the order, which is a horrible approximation in its own right, but at least you know already through the first few words, 
that you've pretty much pinned down the remaining set of words and the distribution that they come from. So that means that the words are not independently drawn from each other anymore. Because otherwise you would have something like Libre as well and then the document would continue in English. That would be perfectly reasonable. Except that it doesn't. So exchangeability is a well, it's basically a less stringent condition on objects than independence. Likewise, we now have exchangeability within the set of documents. Now that means that the order in which the documents occur doesn't matter. But as a corpus as a whole, their occurrence is not independent of each other anymore. So for instance, you know, I, I might have a corpus of only English documents. So then therefore, knowing you know the first thousand of those documents and they're all English, I can infer that the rest is probably also going to be all English. That's information that you usually actually use for inference purposes. So what you lose is the independence, but you get a much more compact representation. So we basically now have two parts. We have one which is basically you know P of Y D1 to Y D M given alpha. And then we have, you know, the probability of the corresponding words for which, you know, the you know, you know, topic ID is J. So basically what I mean with this selection, given beta, is sum over all the possible topics. We will go into the algebra in a moment. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not quite sure what both of these distributions represent. So at the moment they are just abstract objects of, you know, this stuff is not independent anymore and will, you know, figure out placeholders from them as we go along. Um, but basically what we lose is the independence where I could write everything just as a product of a distribution and, you know, without further sums and so on. So it'll become clear in a few slides. Um, so an example of an exchangeable set of random variables which is not independent is suppose I give you the set of integers between 1 and 100 right, in some arbitrary permutation. So the, then if I give you the first 99, you can figure out what the last number is going to be. So while the order in which I observe those numbers may not matter, it clearly means that if I know 99 of them, I know what the 100th one is going to be. Okay, so let's just look at what we did a couple of weeks ago. So we looked at conjugate <coughs> priors. And conjugate priors basically say that, you know, they should have the form of, should have the same functional form as P of fake dot given theta. So, so they should look like a posterior on the you know, fake down, or the other way around, the posterior should be in the same functional class as the prior. That's actually how you want it. So in that case, if I want to you know, estimate P of a little x, so that's a new instance given capital X, the stuff that I've already observed, well, I can write it out as P of little x given theta, which is my natural parameter, times P of theta given you know, all the data that I've already observed. So far, so good which is, of course, now just expanding terms, P of x given theta, that's fine. Now by base rule, I can write it as P of capital X given theta times P of x fake given theta d theta. Now since I know that the order doesn't matter, I can just throw everything together into one big bag. And so I have the union of, you know, a new data point where I want to predict on the data that I've actually observed and the fake data and that integrated out will, in, with suitable normalization, give me exactly my predictive distribution. So this is just like you know taking the data that you've seen, adding the fake data, and then checking for a new instance, well, would it actually fit into this bag? And yeah, that's basically what you do when you collapse. Now, in terms of algebra, here's what happens. Remember, this was our conjugate prior, right? This was basically the fake 
mean, fake sample size, and here's the fake normalization. And this just needs to make sure, so it's just our log partition function from the exponential families, and this ensures that everything is properly normalized to one. Okay? Any questions here at that point? Okay. Now, okay, what happens is, of course, you know, this is the area, it's given by, you know, like in the times prior. Yeah, so, like, terms. so let's just plug it in. So that's e to the m naught mu naught. That's what we have here. This is what we have from the actual data that we observed from our exponential families model. Because we had files x i dot theta, such as everything pulled together. Actually, let me explain it on the whiteboard. This is an important statement. So, remember we had here x parameterized by theta is x of phi of x dot theta minus g of theta. Okay. And furthermore, we knew that we know that p of theta is x of now m naught mu naught dot theta minus m naught g of theta minus h of m naught mu naught m naught. And this is a normalization to make sure this is actually you know, a proper distribution. <coughs> so for instance, for a Gaussian, this is the Gaussian chart. And those things tend to be extremely nasty. So you are going to try as much as you can to actually avoid ever manipulating those terms explicitly, like in the home world. Don't try evaluating this explicitly as long as you can avoid it. Otherwise, you will just fill pages. Okay. Now, therefore, p of you know theta given x is proportional to is the product. Well, we can product overall i p of x i parameterized by theta times p of theta. Base rule. So like here. Now we plug this in here. We plug that in here. Collect terms. And voila, we end up with this. Okay. So there's really nothing scary about it. I don't know, usually when I see conjugate priors explained, it looks really intimidating and gross algebraically, because there's just a lot of math on the page, but that's really the only conceptual thing that you need to know. Now, of course, the one thing that we haven't solved yet is how do we normalize this, right? So what we need to do is we need to integrate out over theta and then divide by that integral. Okay? Now let's do that. So, the integral, you know, x of, well, let me just call it, uh, okay, well, actually, put it mu naught, m naught plus mu of x, m, theta minus m naught plus m times g of theta, d theta. So where's an idea how to compute that integral? Well, we have to figure out how, to, how that is called anyway, because that's exactly what we have in our conjugate prior, right? So just define m naught mu naught and m naught to be exactly these sums, right? Then we already know what our distribution has to look like in order to be properly normalized. That term, that function tells us how it's normalized. It's h. So 
this is nothing than x of h of this chunk here goes in there, this chunk here goes in there. Okay. Once we have that, we have this equation. And this is cool because for all useful, you know, conjugates, some poor sod already worked out what this function h needs to look like. So your job is only to, you know, open the book on, you know, Gauss Bichard. Okay, well, this is our h function. So you just rewrite the variable definitions. So you don't actually have to solve the integral. So the trick is just, you know, how to be sufficiently lazy and never really solve the integral yourself. Or then, you know, have mathematical what you solve it. And, well, for the Dirichlet, somebody has already done that for us, right? Remember? In the means, or in the unnatural parameters, like the, we already have this normalization. And by squinting at it hard enough, you can see that this is actually our normalization term once we take the log. This is our h function. So, in other words, h of alpha becomes this term. So, then, well, what do we get? We, so there was, maybe about up to two, three years ago, in a lot of Bayesian non-parametric papers, people would throw lots of ratios of gamma functions around. I'm not quite sure whether to intimidate people or for whatever other purpose, but that's essentially these normalizations. And, well, now you can actually see how these things equate reasonably well. So you can basically see that P of X union X is going to be proportional, we need to renormalize properly. Um, so we have that first, right? gamma of sum over pi alpha i divided by product over i gamma over alpha i. That was from the from this term here. And then we multiply that by the product of gamma of alpha i plus n i. So that's basically if you increment the count <coughs> for all the guys that you didn't already have, but you would basically have plus, you know, delta, um, you know, x equals y, and here in the denominator you would have the gamma of the sum over i alpha i plus n i plus 1. So the sum of the n i's, that was exactly what we have in here. This x can take on any specific value. Right? So this is basically if x can, you know, for a multi-node distribution, you know, anything can say between 1 and maybe 100. Right? Okay, so the good thing is, out of all this scary stuff here, most of the things disappear. Well, this doesn't really depend on x, so away it goes. This doesn't really depend on x, so away it goes. The only term that depends on x is the one for which x equals i is triggered. Everything else is the same. So I can write that this is proportional to alpha i plus n i. That's our gamma function. Because I can basically write this as you know all the terms without the delta plus another factor. And all the terms without the delta are of course unchanged. So what do we get? Question? Yes? 
I didn't quite follow the second term. So first term is just a normal line variable. Right? So, so, so this is just a constant. It doesn't depend on the lengths. Yeah, I know that. But before that, how did you, how did you write down the second term? I didn't understand. Okay, that. so Anything. that's this piece here, right? That we need to express in terms of the ratio of these gamma gammas. So that's our h term. And now we just need to stop into this r prior. So these are our alphas. And this is what we actually observe. And in order to know, you know what happens for p of x uni capital X, maybe for this additional instance, that's exactly where we need to evaluate this expression here for the additional instance. That's what we did on the whiteboard before in terms of derivation. Right. But we looked at, you know, that of course p of x little x given capital X is proportional to that. Right? So that's how we work our way through. So the conditional is proportional to the joint here, and the second joint is fixed. Then we can throw away this normalization. We can throw away the denominator. Indeed, the numerator we can basically write it as, you know, essentially I can write this as you know, in i times, well, now for i plus n i here, if x equals y. And now, of course, this also goes out of the window, so this is really the only thing that survives. Now, properly renormalized, this gives us exactly the Laplace smoother. So the Laplace smoother is nothing else but, you know, take your actual counts, add the pseudo counts to it, and divide by the sum over everything. So this entire atrocious mess with, you know, gamma functions and logs thereof and so on, so that looked really ugly, has now become something very trivial that you can explain to basically any undergrad in a minute. Now this looks like too much of a coincidence, right? It turns out that this type of reasoning holds in general, approximately. So you can do a Taylor expansion in general for exponential families and conjugates, and you will get that type of behavior. I still, I still do understand what goes inside of uh, the gamma function of the second term. Okay. How would you get alpha plus 10? Well, this is what the... Okay, so... Okay, so... Fine. Okay. So... One thing that we know is that P of theta is given alpha is going to be proportional to product i going from 1 to k theta i to the alpha i minus 1. Okay. Now what I need to do is I need to you know multiply that with a suitable coefficient such that this is a proper probability distribution over theta. So what I need to do is, I need to compute the integral d theta, theta in the probability simplex, okay, of i one to k theta i to the top of one. That's the integral that I need to solve. Now, if you do that, you end up exactly <coughs> So you can check that with Mathematica. Or derive it from scratch if you want. I would say I'd probably ask Mathematica. But you can derive it from scratch, but we're not going to do it in class here. But this is basically how you get this mess of gammas. 
Um, does that answer your question a little bit, where the gammas come from? That wasn't my question. I, my question okay. was, I understood, understood the first term, which uh -huh. is the gamma ratio. I didn't understand the second term. So the second term is yeah. now what happens if you... This, the first term is what you have for the prior, right? Yeah. Now, for your posterior to be properly normalized, you need to be able to solve the integral as well, to renormalize the, to, to get a, a posterior, right? So basically, you know, what you need in order for, you know, P of, you know, P of theta given X, right? This is proportional to, you know, P of theta times P of X. Now, to make that a proper probability distribution, you need to be able to solve this. you want to find the integral d theta of all this mix. And that's exactly what gives you the ratio of gammas. But now the normalization happens for you know prior plus evidence. Okay. Um, so I am afraid I think we probably need to move on. Uh, and so if you don't mind taking it on face value, a face value that, well, essentially that this holds, that basically P of, P of little x given capital X and the alphas is given by this divided by sum of pi, goodness to be all the pain that we've had, alpha pi, So, if you're willing to accept this, we can actually move on. Um, I, I, are you guys comfortable doing that, or should I go through the derivation again? Who wants me to go through it again? Uh, what is the definition of ni? So the ni's are the counts how many times in capital X, you know, ca capital, you know, in any, any, anything in X has the value i. So for instance, if I have a dice, you know, i may range from 1 to 6, and then in 5 is like how many times I see a 5. So, So now what that means is that we can, I mean for a Gibbs sample, what all we care about is, see, I mean, after all, this is the only variable that we don't know. We have our data, we have our prior. So the only thing that we don't know is the topic assignment for each product. And we've integrated out the rest already. And now we have this big mess, but inside this big mess, whenever we change a single yij, so basically a single topic assignment for a single word, the only terms that we really need to worry about is are the terms that really depend on that single topic assignment. Everything else we can leave out because they're just multiplicative terms. That's the nice thing about the Gibbs sampler. You only really need to care about all the variables that this one variable change touches. Everything else you can freeze. You don't even need to know. Remember, that was the idea of a Gibbs sampler. You know, you draw one variable, condition on everything else, and you pick the next variable, you draw, and you keep on doing that. Right. Okay, so now the good thing is that we only have really two terms. We have here, this is basically the topic distribution for a particular document. And I need to explain a little bit what the minus, I, minus ij is and minus i means. So see, we are reassigning a topic for a particular document. So in that case, this counts how many times a particular topic occurs in a particular document. If I disregard the ij verb, in other words, so if I, for document i, disregard the j verb, that's the counting for everything but you know the verb acquisition ij. That's much smoother. 
And in here, that's exactly this ratio that we had over there. That's the total number of words that occur in a particular document without the one at the i's position. So that's just length of the document minus one plus the smooth of two to be normalized. So that gives me essentially my you know, p of y given the alphas. If I just change that one single term. But now I have a second term here which affects how you know this will change my language model. And so what I need to do is I need to check, you know, give suppose I have I picked a particular topic, you know, what the probability for the associated word is in that topic. <coughs> so that is now given by you know number of times I've seen a word occur in a particular topic. Again, ignoring that guy, plus my smoother. And now here I need to sum over all the words in that topic. So actually this is wrong. This should be beta w. These things are wrong. So <clears throat> what it really means is here we look at, you know, how likely is that word as opposed to any other word for a given topic. And the product of those two terms are the only things that are really affected by reassigning a single topic assignment. So whenever I want to resample a particular topic assignment, I compute this thing. And I have to renormalize it to make sure it's a proper probability distribution. And then I draw from that. And then I move on to the next word. I reassign that its topic. And I keep on doing this. So the cool thing that's happening here now is that the only statistic that I need to keep track of is are those count variables. So basically I need to keep track of how many times a particular word is assigned to a particular topic. It's going to be a sparse matrix. So I mean there might be some words that are really very frequent and for those it's going to be dense, but for the rest it's going to be sparse. So this is all that really happens in the Gibbs sample. <coughs> um, so I mean, obviously, this is constant. Um, there are LDA sampler codes out there which recompute that at every step, even though it's constant. So big warning, when you want to actually use code, make sure you understand the math behind it and check what it does occasionally. So this stuff makes it very slow if you have to renormalize. Any questions at this stage? This is it's a reasonably important part. Yep. This code will give you a bunch of samples for topics and words. Correct. What if you let's not get rid of your focus is perhaps topics over documents. Yep. So so what this will give you is Exactly. So it'll give you top. It'll assign a new topic to a particular word within a particular document. Now, then you can ask, you know, what is the topic distribution for a document, right? And that's exactly given by this term here, right? So this is basically, you know, topics over documents. This is topics over words, and it's the product of those two that really affect everything. So this is like what we had before in our matrix matrix multiplication, except that we now have a really weird way of computing those two things. Okay. Yep. Can you explain again the, the like minus i j notation? I okay. Think that's so the minus i j notation that's actually a very common thing that you will see in a lot of papers. So it's useful to to know that basically. It means leave the ij pair out. So sometimes people will write stuff like x minus i. And that means effectively x1 up to xi minus 1, xi plus 1 up to xn. So that's leave the guy, that guy out. In the context of counters, it means count everything but that particular pair. I is the document 
number and, and j is the word number? Yes. And it's the same in the denominator? Yeah, actually, you should probably also have an ij here. But there it's sort of obvious because it's already for that particular document. But yeah. So the only thing is that, of course, that doesn't really matter very much because you, you know, the documents don't really get longer or shorter. So that's why this denominator is actually irrelevant. So the only term you really care about is this here. Okay. What is that equal to? Is that a topic? So what that is the to? unnormalized probability of P of topic for a particular position given everything else. That is, given all the other topic assignments, given all the other words. Probability of what? The probability of that, of a topic, of, you know, you need to plug it in here, given all the other counts, all the other words. So, now, the key point is that for most words, there's only a small number of topics that actually really matter. And the unfortunate thing is if we actually want to, you know, compute things, we still need to have a properly normalized probability distribution. Right. And so, what you can do is you can exploit sparsity in this expression here to speed things up. Let me write it out in detail, then we'll have one more slide and a break. So I'm walking you through this in a fair amount of detail for a good reason, because it's a nice example of where you have a general model first, you then really reduce the number of variables by collapsing, which can speed up inference. And then you exploit sparsity structure in order to speed it up further. And each of those things give you an order of magnitude speed up easily. One to two orders of magnitude, actually. And while you may not necessarily have a topic model later on to deal with, you can use the same set of strategies to speed up your sample. So what we have is basically the n minus ij td plus alpha t times we have the n minus ij tw plus beta w, so let's just fix it in the cycle, divided by, here we have n minus ij of t, so that's just given by summing over all the words, plus, let's call it beta bar, let's sum over all the words again. So as I said, that was cycle. It should be t, it should be w. Well, let's make this, everything else is fine. Okay. Now, if you squint at that expression hard enough, and we need to later on compute the sum of this over all the topics, you see the following thing happening. This, this part here is sparse. That's good. This part here is sparse. This piece is things. And this is things. Okay. Now, Let's say we have 100 topics, that's not a big deal. Once I have 1,000 topics and only, you know, maybe 10 or 15 of these terms are non-zero, that's a big deal. So how can we use the fact that we have paid something dense plus sparse and only pay the same price as you would pay for, dense, for sparse? Okay. And this is a very, very ingenious trick that uh, David Mimno and Andrew McCall came up with. And Basically, in hindsight, it's so blindingly obvious. Here's what, what you get. You basically take, you expand that product. So you have n minus ij of t and d times, and here you have the ratio again. Then, 
you have plus alpha t times n minus ij of t and w divided by whatever we have in the denominator. So this is sparse. This is sparse. And then we have a dense term. Plus alpha t times beta w divided by n minus ij of t plus. Now that's nice. It's nice because, well, this thing doesn't really change much. This, doesn't, this is actually completely word independent, right? That's good. This is sparse, and this is sparse. So you just compute that once for a document and forget about it. Or actually, I mean, the only thing you need to do is just change one of those terms, right? If you resample a particular topic assignment, everything else stays the same. So you compute it once and just change two of the summons as you need to sum over t. This is sparse, so you can do it very cheaply anyway. And ditto here. So if you only have 10 non-zero topics, or topics with non-zero counts, out of a thousand, you get the massive speed up. As a matter of fact, that's pretty much the reason why we can do user profiling in Yahoo. It's such a simple idea, it's very beautiful. So, the guys who came up with it. I think around 2009. So then what you do, you resample, you update your counts, you move on to the next word and you keep on doing it. And this is the overall template for a single machine. So you do like a thousand Gibbs sample sweeps. Now that's a good number to be done with. You take each document, for each word within that document, you resample the topic for the word. You update the local document topic tables, and you update the machine, or wait, you ignore that global part at the moment, but we basically update the word topic, topic table as well. This one's easy. That is something that that particular CPU owns. This is also reasonably easy. But if you had several machines that all wanted to sample things, if I change the counts for a particular word, I first need to stop all other machines that update that word, such that they have the new count and then move on. And this is a disaster. So after the break, I'll show you how you can fix this disaster. And we'll cheat a bit in doing so. Okay, good. So we'll have like a 10 minute break.